Welcome to the new episode of All That Jazz. I'm your host, Matyash, and I have with me Deepa Kana Subti. Welcome to the podcast. Hey there. Hi. Hi. So I, I think I found you as a lot of my guests uh, through a random ad on, on Facebook. And uh, I saw on your website that you paint and uh, you write poems and stuff. So um, is this something you always did, painting and stuff? No, actually, it's something I never did uh, until I started doing it, mm. which which basically means that when I was little and I went to school and university and postgraduate school and stuff, I was uh, doing something completely different. I was a, uh, a fund manager for a direct investment firm in high finance in Hong Kong. The last I was doing more regular things. And that was about 21 years ago. Wow. Um, so education and conditioning was not towards the arts at all. Right, right. But something that uh, I liked. So as a little girl, I remember wanting to draw. And I don't think I was ever very good at uh, regular drawing at all. But that didn't keep me from wanting to draw whenever I had uh, free time away mm. from school or family. And the writing and the poetry, I think, is similar since I was quite little, I was very intrigued by life, uh, a little bit more than what I was being told by my family and culture and education and religion and all of that. Didn't answer a lot of very basic questions I had mm. that death, you know, what is time? What is space? Um, why are some people poor and some rich? Uh, where do we go after we die? I mean, kind of the basic things that I think everybody wants to know, but they never answer directly, are they, by the world in which we live. So in a way, I think the reason we have all these institutions is because we cover up these basic questions. They're not answered and then we get distracted by other things. So I think it was only a matter of time that um, I would leave behind a more structured way of life and pursue my heart's longing, you might say towards art and towards uh, philosophy, which again, I never studied, but now I write, uh, I write poetry. I've got over 250 poems on my website and the art is abstract as well. So mm -hmm. it, it's with what I write about. This is your is, art piece and behind you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. So my whole home is, <laughs> nice. is filled with art stuff. I mean, there are galleries and things around the world that, that show it, but there's always stuff lying at home. So that's the background that, no, I didn't always do art, but to come back to the art a little bit, it's a very interesting uh, story uh, about how it started for me. So after my, when my daughter was to be born, I gave up mainstream uh, life in finance. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'd go back later when she's older, but I completely went into philosophy and art. And of course, being a mom for her, and I was just doing a few hobby classes here and there with art with no real plans to do anything with it, just enjoying it a little bit. And I had a chance meeting with a lady, a stranger who was sitting across me at my coffee shop that I go to every day for the last 14 years here in Singapore. Mm -hmm. So that's where I do my writing and everything. And uh, she started talking to me about the book I was reading, which is a very um, interesting book called i am that it's it's quite it's got quite a cult following oh, yeah, around it's, the world. It's, but that guy that i can't pronounce his it's last name so he, he's my guy and he's he's the one whose books i still read okay uh every day, even if it's for 10 minutes or whatever so she started talking to me about the title of the book and she said well what do you do you're quite young to just sit here and read these books i mean what do you do so i was like this is what i do and i'm very happy with it you know i i think about philosophy I do some poetry I'm a mom I do a little bit of art and she said what do you paint and I just showed her one of my paintings and she said that I'm actually an art fair organizer and I'm in this cafe to put my little pamphlets here for my art fair in two months time so do you mm -hmm. want to show your work and somehow I just said yes because there was no reason to say no and I didn't need to check on her or find out more I just said yeah sure why not and that was when it just got started for me in a very big way. So I had my first show two months from that date and I worked day and night. It was a solo show and it was very successful. I was the biggest Wait, seller in her. So, so the solo yeah. show was basically, it was just your art and nothing else? 
it was uh, my art and it was her idea to also also show the poems so she it was her idea to actually put a poem for each art piece have it the same title mm-hmm. because she'd read my poetry as well during the next few weeks that she got to know me better and so that's how it got started just by chance no planning no thinking uh, just mm-hmm. a simple yes on both sides and a simple flow and then onwards i went on to europe i won some awards um in london i got selected for the london biennale and some museums and this and that and it got quite serious you might say which i wasn't expecting and i wasn't looking for at this stage of my life so i told my husband that um i don't want the stress of this so because i'm i'm also doing a lot of charity work since i was quite young um, my mm-hmm. husband and i together so i told him that i'm not looking for this for anything personally for myself but it's come my way and i do like painting so let's just donate the money to charity so that way you know that part the commercial part is not something i'm engaged with as such so from my practice um 75% of the profits go to charity and the list of the charities that i support are also on my website but at the moment if somebody likes my paintings i'm happy for them to give the money to whatever charity they like um so that way i get to paint and they get hopefully art they like and the money goes to i think where it belongs because i don't need it okay so so i, I of- i'm guessing your your husband is doing pretty well in the business or something yeah yeah so we're both from finance so he continued mm-hmm. with finance i quit and i guess we're we're doing fine um we've actually even when we didn't have much money we used to donate quite a bit because money was never our driver you might say mm-hmm. so it but us even when we couldn't afford a car or there many basic things i think that we didn't have at one stage of our life but that never bothered us so even then we used to to share with with the needy um but again like i mentioned to you the other day i mean i i don't do this because it's a good thing to do i do this because this is what i do it it just comes naturally so that's my way of um living that all of us have certain things within us which are very natural to us they're effortless yeah and then so you don't force it it just kind of yeah you don't uh, do it because it's leading somewhere you don't do it because it's good for you it's it's going to make you live longer or something <laughs> you just do it because well that's what you do yeah you know that's interesting so, so the um i'm going back to that book i am that the it, isn't that uh, how, how do you pronounce his name i always mess it up yeah nisargadatta maharaj Ma- maharaj i'll call him maharaj yeah call him maharaj <laughs> call him maharaj yeah right and he um uh like obviously a mystic and all that and he but isn't he associated with the uh hindu religion per se no 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 actually no no, no. so i'll give you a bit of background about uh him and i and what what uh, the philosophy part is about mm. um so what happened with me with with this brain was when i was 17 i got into a bit of a trauma situation i was uh, starting my grade 12 exams which were quite a big deal for me at that time because i was a very goal oriented kid i wanted to do, do well and you know just a very typical run of the mill uh, this was in living. singapore no 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 this was in india when oh, i was india. going okay. up oh, sorry yes we're talking about 1987 uh when i had my grade 12 exam and it was a very big thing for me and my granddad used to live with us and i was very close to him and he was old and i knew he would pass on but he had passed on the same night the previous night and he was in hospital and my mother didn't tell me but just when i was getting into the car to go to the exam hall somebody came over to offer condolences and just hearing that news at that moment that he's dead uh just got me into a complete shock uh i don't know why and how and i remember my stomach muscles within a few seconds became like stone and i went into a bit of a panic but a very numb place and i don't remember after that how i even took the exams but i guess i was well prepared so i did well but i went into shock and i went into extreme fear of death mm. so after the exams got over in a few weeks time uh and i had a few months off before my university started I was completely without anything to do and I just couldn't sleep. I was obsessed with death that I'm going to die. I'm going to die that anybody can die. What is this? How can you just die? Where did he go? You know, it's like the same questions I had as a child. Yeah. Uh 
full on because they were in my face and uh, I couldn't get out of it. And there was nobody around me who could help me. I couldn't really talk about this to anybody in my family. And after about three months of uh, not sleeping, I think I got into a bit of a zone in my head. And that's when something very interesting happened. Uh, I'm still 17 uh, and we'd moved to another city where I was to start university. And I remember taking a piece of paper and my hand uh, started asking me questions. I started writing mm. things to ask help. So it was another oh, part of on. my brain. When you say not, not sleeping, do you mean like sleeping two hours a day or not sleeping at all for? Hardly sleeping. Mm. I mean, I guess as one, it's a long time ago though. So as a young person, you can probably tolerate not sleeping yes. much for months, right? Probably I can't deal with it now. But at that time, it was just lack of sleep, lack of the ability to take the fear out and no mm. help whatsoever. No religion, no family, no therapist, no friend, right? So a part of me got activated in the brain because I was at such a corner that I couldn't get out of that corner of fear, extreme fear of death and needing answers, you know, like how the anxious brain gets. I want an answer. I want this solved. So that part of my brain was very clear cut. It was not very loving or anything, but it was logical. And because mm. I have a little brain, I was a very good math student and I was a very good student, which is why I went into finance and all that. So it asked me some very simple logical questions and it said, okay, so dead bodies freak you out, but there is a chicken in the freezer, which is a dead chicken. And you're going to eat that tomorrow, right? Right. And so do you actually think there's a difference between the chicken's dead body and a human being's dead body? Is there an actual difference? And I was writing the answers back on the same piece of paper. I mean, the little girl who's terrified. Mm. And I said, well, of course, there's no difference. So it said to me, but you're behaving as if there's a big difference, aren't you? It's freaking you out. You see a human being's dead body and you get freaked out. You see a chicken even without skin and without feathers and you're completely okay with it. So you do admit that you have double standards. So I said, well, yeah, I guess. Right. Wow. That's intense and already. <laughs> yeah. So then it asked me the next question. It said, so you're not sleeping because you're waiting for your mom to give you a hug. And you keep saying that I'll only sleep when somebody comforts me and says to me, everything will be okay. And then I'll sleep. So then it says to me, if you already know what you want to hear to feel better, why the hell can't you say it to yourself? Why do you create another person outside to say something to you that you already know is going to make you feel better? Why must it come from another source? You already know it's, that's what you want to hear. And you also assume that the mother's not capable of it. So you love drama, don't you? Mm. So basically it showed me in, and it kept writing. It kept writing. It wouldn't stop. It showed me that I already contained my entire world. It was made of my own beliefs, which are all very contradictory in nature, extremely contradictory. So it says that you can only see outside what you already have inside. Otherwise you wouldn't be able to recognize it. So if you see hate, or if you say I'm unloved, you mm. already contain the concept of what it means to be unloved in you. Otherwise you wouldn't be able to understand it. Yeah, and that aligns okay. also with, um... The famous psychologist Carl Jung saying that uh, what you hate in other people, you you don't like in yourself, basically. Yeah, basically you contain the concept. I, I mm. would then, so something had opened up, but the girl was still freaking out. So it had only opened up at the level of the brain that relates to handwriting, but I couldn't act it. I couldn't feel it. I couldn't talk about it. Mm. And when I read it, when I read those pages, the last lines I remember were, so don't you see, you already contain your own father, your own brother, your own lover, because you already know what they mean. And that's what you're going to see outside because you already contain it within you as beliefs. And I tore it up. I completely tore it up because I thought I was going mad, that I'd finally lost my brain. And I remember telling my parents, I'm not okay. I need to see a doctor. Oh my. And they did. And they did take me to a psychiatrist who met me and said, you just bored and, you know, your university starting, you'll be fine. There's nothing terribly off with you. And, you know, did he do any tests or anything or he would just no, like, he, he just had a chat with me. He knew my <laughs> scores in, 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 in school being very, very high, getting into one of the top universities in the country. And he was like, you just got an overactive, overintelligent brain and you just need to be busy doing something. You're too young to have too much time on your hands. Or maybe he was right, but right. that's how it started, that 
something had started, but I wasn't living it at that time. I was mm-hmm. still behaving like a nervous, uh, anxious person who's scared of this, scared of that, scared of dying, scared of, you know, all of those things. Yeah. And I went back to mainstream life and mainstream life kept being difficult. Uh, and I came to this point very often when I was at a corner where I didn't like what was happening. And the same part of my brain would come back and say to me, so whatever you're saying is happening to you right now, like, you know, break up with boyfriend or somebody broken your heart or whatever, is this very unique to you or does it happen to many, many people? And the answer was, of course, it happens to many people. So it would say to me, so drop the drama, let's get on with life. Because if it can happen to others, it can happen to you. It was very logical, the way my math brain is, okay? And that Mm. was enough to show me that the entire drama of the human condition is taking your problems to be somehow very unique and very special. When that is not the case, indeed, because your yeah. world, which you pain, has enough people who don't have food to eat, who have immense problems, if you want to call it problems. But somehow your broken heart and your fear of death or whatever just takes over and you start behaving wow. like uh, something huge is happening. So that was happening at regular intervals with me. And I was still reacting as if something's wrong. And then more and more, you might say, dramatic things started happening. So my husband, uh, he was diagnosed with cancer that he was going to die in a few months. And I was pregnant with my child. The first child was three years old and I had a horrible pregnancy. I was on the bed, couldn't even go with him to hospital. And I remember when he called me and he said that the gastroenterologist has said it's a huge tumor and that. I'm not going to be able to make it till the birth of our second child even. And of course, you know, you have the first reaction is, oh my God, why is this happening? This is very bad, isn't it? Same thing, very bad, big problem, death, huge issue, husband, very special, my life, very special. The same voice came back the next day and he said, so cancer, how common is it in your world? And I said, it's pretty damn common. And he said, so if other people can get it other people can lose family members somehow you can't so i'm like of course i can was this a voice was this a voice inside or annoying or something no it's just like i mean it's not like a voice with sound but you know what i mean it's like your own brain is asking you hey slow down yeah no let's calm down the let's let's talk of our world and where we are And, and my husband by that time he'd known me for a long time i told him the exact same thing i said you know what this is not a problem, whatever it is. Let's switch on the TV. Let's watch some cricket. Let's get some tea going. I refuse to live my life um, labeling it, dividing it into problems and solutions. Whatever is, is. It has its place. It's here. We'll deal with it. But right now, a cup of tea is what we need. And I think there was an entire dropping, dropping of that heavy, this is a problem. And my life has a problem. You know, when will this go away? What does this mean? Doctor, blah, suffering, mm. blah, you know? And he, he completely came into that energy as well. He dropped it completely as well. And within six hours, we got a call from the doctor and he said, I've got some really good news. It's not cancer. We don't know what it is. It is something serious. It's not cancer. So by this time, I was starting to see a fantastic connection between reactivity and energy and emotion Mm. and what we actually see in our world. And I had seen by then that the more I dropped emotion and taking things personally and unique and very special and me, 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 if the I story was dropped, the drama itself didn't stick around much. So... So If you you just thought about it as in a third person or it's happening to some person in the uh in Oroville or some some other place in India whatever it it's not concerning you so it's like a almost impersonal yeah I mean the point is that wherever you are right things happen but the brain translates according to what it expects and according Mm. to its 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 value system of right and wrong there's a heavy judgment and a lot of specialness to my life my body Even though whatever issue my body has, many others have, but somehow my body's more special. So I think this was all tying in with what had been seen at 17. Mm. And so back to Nisargdatta. So from that point in Hong Kong with my husband, and of course it took many years to get better. 
because it was an issue, but it wasn't cancer. It took him a few years and they were not easy years. And then there were other challenges in our life. But uh, I was starting to become a very philosophical person, you might say, and very calm and starting to see life differently from you know, constant reactions that we have as people and starting to question uh, what is a person? Is there even a person here? Um, you know, because when you're looking, right, you're seeing everything. When, I, when my eyes are looking, I may focus on something, but my raw data of experience is that everything appears together. When I wake up in the morning, it's not just me who's waking up. The world is in a way waking up with me all together. I'm never just me, the body that's up and here. There's also the bed, there's the floor, there's the music, there's the bird sound. It's all together, right? When was this it, before, before you read uh, Maharaj? Yes, yes, this was, this was before. This was oh, wow. before. So I don't, started to see that there's no division in my raw data of experience. Hmm. Same thing. You know, when you go into a classroom, you're looking for your child, your eye is seeing every child equally together. It's only the brain that is saying, oh, not mine, not mine, ah, mine. And there comes a comfort because there's a correlation to mine is equal to comfort, not mine is equal to no reaction. You see? And okay, then it but does it's important to recognize your child too, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you do. I mean, those yeah. are basic things. Yes. But when we're suffering, that's when we're looking at stuff like attachments and we are, we are dismantling this entire structure of what's not me. Yeah. And then you come to know that your child is not really your child. Nothing is really yours. That's why you don't know why this body does what it does because it's not yours, right? If it was yours, you'd know any little pain, what it means. You need to read a book, you need the internet, you need a doctor. If it's really yours, you'd know about well, right. it. Right, I didn't really create it. I didn't create it. It's, it's just something exactly. given to me, right? Not to me, but then the whole world is given to me, is it not? So that's the point I'm making. There's no distinction. The body is not ever given to me alone. The entire world is given. Hmm. When is the body the world? Was the question I was asking myself all the time. When is it separate? So the only place it exists separately from the world is in an image in my head as a thought. Hmm. You see? So that's when language comes in. So we human beings, because we have language, we have words. And words almost mean separately existing things, which is just not our actual experience. So we then start talking in terms of language and feeling in terms of language. We start saying my shoe, my body, whereas the body is never separate from the wall, from the floor, from the tree, from the food, from the next person. But in words, I start talking as if they're separate things and I start having emotions as if they're separate things. And then I start to focus on those separate objects or things and I start to know a lot about them in terms of knowledge because I'm interested because whatever I'm interested in opens up a whole world about itself mm. right? but the raw data remains that there's only oneness and our eyes our senses are picking up everything together after that comes the memory of what I like and what I don't like what's mine and what's not mine right so right. I was able to now distinguish how suffering occurs what's what's the platform so that's when, and I've been reading up a little bit here and there on philosophy because I was interested in the subject now, by now. And I didn't like anything I read because they kept referring to the person getting something. Whereas I had seen that the person doesn't exist on his own. So I don't believe in the person anymore. Then came, I am that in my hand. And I remember when I reached page three, I cried because this was what I had seen at 17. This mm -hmm. was the tone. This was the most logical, straightforward, intellectual method of investigating your actual experience and seeing where is the specialness? Where is the person? Show him to me. So I loved it. I knew this is it. I don't need to get another author or whatever. So I read it and I still read his books because it's a bit of a habit of mine, but I do my own thing. I do my own writing. So, um, yeah, I mean, and out wow. of that, so much come out. So much has come out. The fact that you don't exist, the fact that you're everything, because everything exists together, right? The fact that so that's why my my practice, my website is called Emptiness is Full. Mm. Found. I li I like yeah, I read that poem. I liked it. Um, but back back to Maharaj, I I had heard of him because my my spiritual teacher, David Hawkins, mentioned him and recommended him highly. 
and mm. I heard of the other guy, um, uh, Ramana Maharshi. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They were, um, I think they were alive at about the same time. I think uh, Maharshi yes, died years before uh, Maharaj. Yes. I think Maharaj died in the 80s, right? 81, yeah. 81, yeah. right, right. Yeah, but their, their, their temperament and their frequencies are a little different. The message is exactly the same. So I prefer Maharaj's books because of my uh, resonance with my, the way my brain operates. I'm very yeah. no non uh, type. Although I, am, I can be sweet and emotional and I, I really tap into people's pain and all that I always have. But basically I'm very clear cut, right? So Maharaj's method is that of investigation. Uh, Ramna Maharishi is softer. You know, he's, he's, he's softer. So I have read his books, but they didn't draw me as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's about what attracts you, obviously. Um, and yeah. they're both what, uh, high spiritual state, I would say. So uh, what is um, uh, Maharaj's then uh, style of inquiry or what does he do? Because I haven't, I, I plan to read his book. I haven't read his books yet. I think he, he will just take you all the way back from your personhood to the fact that there's consciousness that contains everything and everything appears together. Mm. And that consciousness is the same in everything, right? It's not similar. It's the same. So the same consciousness in a tree produces the universe in which the tree exists. The same consciousness in a mosquito produces a mosquito's world. And same thing in a human brain. Uh, produces a human world but the difference is that uh, in the animals and plants there's just survival instinct which is not self-conscious which doesn't know itself right mm. but it has innate intelligence so it's always the whole in nature it's always the whole and the body is the same as animals or, or plants because it's just responding by itself to the whole it knows how to breathe it's pumping the blood it's responding to viruses, bacteria, naturally. Mm. It has a, it has a immune system, very much like animals. But the only difference is that a human brain has the added ability to take ownership and to translate and to overanalyze and to overthink and divide up the world and see itself as more special, which is exactly what I had seen uh, that I was doing, which was creating my suffering. And you can get very caught in the suffering and the solution for the suffering and thereby you create time. So you go into time because the way things are right now is not good enough. So then yeah. I must have else a goal in the future. And because we know there's no time or space, there's only now. So then we're going into illusion. We're going into time, right? So human beings have this unique way of going into time with their neurosis of specialness of I'm not loved or I'm scared of this or I'm fat or I'm whatever, I'm or, ugly. Or I will love yeah. myself when I get this, when I achieve this goal and then. And, yeah. and somehow it will sustain, but it doesn't sustain because in the field of neurosis, you can only get addiction and fear. So whatever you get, you need the next one. You need the bigger one. You need the better one. There's no end. It's a bottomless pit. I mean, if, if, if you know, mobile phones could satisfy us by now, we should have been satisfied, but we still <laughs> versions right we do right. get new versions we have to because it cannot stop it will not stop so right. so how do you then get to that place where you stop like do you just like allow yourself to be happy in the moment and just be fully in like uh and don't focus on whatever is happening in your life uh externally but just be like i'm here i might as well enjoy it yeah i mean there's there's many ways in which it happens right so mm -hmm. if the neurosis is compulsive which it is for most of us, where we can't help being drawn to certain passions and certain things, right? There, there is suffering and pain, which is a part and parcel of that seeking that I want to get enlightened. Even spirituality gets into time and becomes about, I want to get enlightened like Maharaj. I'm not enlightened. I need to be like him. So the seeking is built in and it'll find ingenuous ways to come in and create time. So that, that seeking energy or that pain of further creation is just observed, is just seen. I think that's where you come to. You can't fight with it at its level because it wants that. It wants to be fought at, at its level because then there'll be time to get over the fight. It's again, creating time. So you only observe without judgment. So you can just hold the pain, you can observe it, you can be aware of it, you can hug it, you can allow it. 
So I think that's the first thing you do. And then of course you go into subtler realms which are more vertical in nature rather than horizontal. So mm. you don't go out of time, you're going more into what does it mean to be present? What is this presence? Not that I'll come to know in five years time when I've done enough yoga, but right now I'm present, right? And what does that mean? What is it? And there's a very subtle, we're going into subtle realms now. It's not about, it's not conditional. It's not conditional to whether I'll be rich or living long or healthy or when this pain will go away, then I'll become present. Yeah. I'm already aware of the pain, right? So I'm already present now, despite the pain. So then there's something else that starts to, I don't even want to say shine through, but there's something else that is sensed, which is very subtle. And uh, then you also then at the same time see that whatever happens in time is transient. It doesn't last. That's the mm. other thing. You can't hold on to anything. Absolutely, you cannot. So at the same time, there are many different things that start to unravel, which is why when I write my poetry, I, don't, I didn't do long discourses at that time when I started writing the poems. I kept them short. Yeah. Because they were full openings, just making you question your own belief. That's mm. all. Five lines, six lines. Now, of course, I write bigger essays, which I haven't yet put on the website. Um, but, you know, even things like death, you know, we, we go on about death, we talk about it, we hide it, we pray for it, we make such a drama about it. But has a dead person come back and said he's dead? Has anybody said they're dead? It's not well, experience. There are and cases where people died clinically and come back, but uh, that's a technicality, I guess. <laughs> technicality, where they haven't actually gone. I mean, it's like deep sleep, right? It's the same thing as deep sleep. Nobody's there in deep sleep to say, hello, I'm in deep sleep, and it's better than that, 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 right? Mm. It's an inexperienced state. So really, all we know is aliveness. And in that aliveness, we have a concept of what is death, which is supposed to scare us. So there we go with the drama again. I don't like dying, but uh, am I dead? No, all we know is aliveness. And in that there's a variety of stuff that occurs, but none of it is owned by anybody. So that's the next thing that opens up, that there's no ownership. Mm. And there is no control over what I can or cannot do or what I can tell you to do. So then that comes in, that whatever I'm describing now is, is merely descriptive, not prescriptive, it cannot be because there's really nobody here who's doing anything. It's just energy, isn't it? So then everything I'm seeing is already me, right? So I can't be telling me what to do. So it's, it's most interesting. I mean, different aspects open up and it's, it's a wonderful play of um, different realms where I can be everything, I can be something, I can be a situation. I don't have to be a person, I could be a situation because there's no real separation. So there's right. only situations, right? But this brain has this ability to blame, has so then, this ability, yeah. Let, let's say, let's so, say the world would be uh, uh, very different if everybody would stop trying to change other people and just focused on doing what they enjoyed and stuff like that. It seems like it would be very different because uh, even in my life, I find that it, I have a lot of shoulds. I should do that. I should study. I should finish my exams. I do do this. There's a there's a lot of there's a lot of shoulds in my life, financial and you know goals and otherwise. So if people didn't have that, would they behave differently? Would they even would they pursue some of the things that they're pursuing now, or, or it'd be totally different? Yes, you know that again. We don't know, but I think that's when we just hmm. come back to what we know at the moment. The moment opens up, and anything can happen in that moment. And I think what you finally come to after years of looking at this, analyzing this, playing with this, enjoying this, even seeing benefits of it, et cetera, is that it's all allowed because it's all transient. So even the divine, most divine knowledge that I don't exist. I mean, I remember when I came to that again and again about five, six years ago, my goodness, I don't exist. My goodness, I'm just a random hallucination of food energy. What's talking right now is the sandwich I had for lunch. Because if I don't have food, where is all this knowledge? Where is the art? Where is the past? Where is memory, right? Nothing exists outside of food energy from, from the earth. And that just randomly hallucinates stuff, which is not real because nothing sticks around. I mean, where is 20 minutes ago or half an hour ago when you and I said hello? If it's so real, show it to me. I know you're recording it, but it's not the same as being present with it. So stuff is just leaving us all the time. So we mm. can't get too 
practice, even about the deepest knowledge. This is key because that again becomes a burden. Then I'll start to tell other people that I know something you don't, and you're behaving like a fool. You're pursuing money. You're I'm just then I'll start judging people. I've divided the world again. You see, and right. I have to carry right. that person in me because I am the world. I have to carry that horrible person in me, and it must be in me, which is why I see it outside. So well, it's yeah. That's a, that's the problem of a lot of people. I mean, including me. Like uh, I have some positions, uh, let's say um, political stuff. And then I see I see this camp, and then I see that camp, and then yeah. that bad camp. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, because the thing about opinions, personal opinions, and good and bad is that if you take a position, it has an energetic component to it. Yes. So to balance energy, it must see its opposite. It's like classical physics then, because a wave in classical physics is the up followed by the down in equal measure. I suppose the, the Hindus would call it karma. So whatever you identify with, whatever you say is better than something else, you must see the other side to balance that out. You know? Or, or force is always, there's always a counter force in physics. Equal right? and opposite reaction. Exactly. So then you're, so you understand everything after a while energetically as well as spiritually, as well as in everyday life. So I think many different parts of the brain start aligning, but you get nowhere. Why? Because you can't leave from here. And mm. whatever this is, is immovable. And this has nothing to do with the character. The character is just a little dream character who seems to, after a while, understand its own non-existence, which people call a little bit of awakening right. or whatever. It may change life because after that, you don't think very much. That's the good thing that happens. Thinking stops. So the anxiety and everything right. doesn't stick around too much because you know that life knows how to run itself. You see, nature is produced by just being alive. Just being alive, the entire cosmos is produced. It does seem, though, that even though we are all people, that people have different interests. So even, so it seems to me, even if this happened, then uh, some people would be more like, would still be interested in, in arguing, you know, going into politics, because that's, um, that comes naturally as, as far as, you know, they're passionate about, this and they're there they maybe the warrior uh, archetype or, or something and then other people yeah. are more you know uh philosophy other people more into art other people more into physical right. stuff sports because that comes naturally right absolutely so then it's all down to it's all god it's all nature somebody's a farmer somebody's a businessman somebody's a banker somebody's a robber you have a saint you have a sinner they they both need each other right so you're saying, is, does, is it important what you choose? Is it at all important to you? You're not the chooser. It chooses you. You're not the chooser. There is no choice. No, <laughs> I'll tell you the, <laughs> okay. the thing about choice is that when naturally an energy is depleting, right? When naturally an energy is depleting, it appears as if you have choice. But that's only because the energy is ready to deplete. So it suddenly looks like, oh, I could stay home or I could go out. It doesn't matter, right? Because there's no big passion behind it left anyway. Right. But till the time, I'm the kind of person who's taking to the streets, I'm leading a bunch of people, I'm marching on the roads, there is no choice. I will go whether rain or shine because the energy is choosing me to do that. But when the energy depletes for no reason that anybody can ever understand, it's a random occurrence, then it looks like this choice. But that's not because I made the choice. That's just because the energy got depleted. But isn't there a moment where um, before uh, when the thought arises that I should go out and march, there is a point where you could turn back. But if you go past it, that point, there's a point of no return. You see what I see what I mean? It's like a train uh, moving. Once you, you no, start the movement, it's hard to stop. Yes, but that's because of the energy that's in built in it, the passion that's given by, by God or by nature. That right. passion is never, nothing is ever personal. I mean, I'm an artist, so I know that I didn't learn this, nor do I, nor can I ever know what I'm going to paint or when I'm going to paint. Right. It does me, it picks me. The, the, the passion comes from who knows where. And all of a sudden I'm painting night and day and then the passion doesn't come for six months. I can't yeah. paint. It's similar to this. I guess I started this by chance because I was on a French podcast and then friends like, I think you'd be good at this. And I was like, yeah, I want to, I want to try it. 
So now I've been doing this for a while. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because this was to happen. I think that's all we can say. So till the time there is personhood, uh, there was a lot of, I did this, you know, but you can't do this. I was such a good kid and you're not They're telling your kids that and all that nonsense. As if, as if I had chosen to be a certain way and as if they have a choice to be anything other than who they are. So I think a big part of this whole process is humility. Absolute and huge amount of humility for the ego, for the person. Mm. Because... Um, nothing really goes your way after a point it tests you and right. you know you are left without a position just like i was at 17 i mean i needed to get over what this damn death is and to be told i'm not gonna die but it just wasn't coming from anywhere i wasn't getting any relief you know so what do you believe gonna... now that will happen after, when you die the physical body dies your body nothing 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 there's nothing left because there's nothing here even right now. There's just some talking from food and it's just nature talking and nature continues to talk, by the way. So let's say, okay, now this is an interesting question. Let's say this body or this life is perceived as uh, being fond of art, okay? Being fond of coffee, mm -hmm. being fond of philosophy, being fond of helping people. Are any of these unique qualities that other people don't have? None of them. Some is people unique. have them. Yes. I mean, it's pretty much random stuff, right? It'll continue. There, there's plenty of other artists. There's plenty of other philosophers. There's plenty of people who like coffee. There are plenty of people who like stupid jokes, like I do. And so there's nothing unique. See, this is where the attachment to yourself goes. When you realize that, first of all, you haven't chosen any of it. Secondly, where does it go in deep sleep? Thirdly, it's there with many others as well. So in a way, life is eternal, you might say, because life is nothing but a bunch of qualities that were never personal. So different bodies do different qualities. Hmm. You know what I mean? Some are more, you know, loud, some are soft. Some yes, are... yes. But I'm, I'm talking more in, in a metaphysical sense. And in, in your sense, um, there, there's a life energy that I think everybody has. So where, where do you think uh, that goes? It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere because it's not really here the way you think it is. This is our thinking that wants an answer to what happens mm. after I die. Nothing happens because even right now, whatever is happening is just an hallucination. It's a complete hallucination. Depending on certain random firings in the brain from food, they're firing here and there. Someday you become interested in music. Ten years later, it looks like you become interested in art. You drop something, you pick something. Random stuff takes interest. Random stuff loses interest, and that will yeah, continue to happen. But like, uh, other... okay. but but the, uh, we're talking di two different things. I think physically mm. it is happening, but but you could say from a higher perspective, it is uh, an illusion because we're not really yeah. perceiving what is really going on, and we're, or maybe we don't have a choice. But uh, physically, I think it is happening. Are you? Are you Okay, <laughs> I have to ask this. So, so you, do you think, are you disputing that it's happening or do you think it's because it's an illusion, it's important is lessened? It's what? It's what it is, what? It's because it's an illusion that it's important, importance is lessened. Ah, see, the point is that it's an illusion, mm -hmm. but it's a divine illusion. And the moment I get too focused on what happens to me, when I die or what happens to my family or whatever, I'm separating that which cannot be separated. So you're always going to come back to point A. Right. So this is where the is going to try all the time through thoughts and through language to go back to a me. But the point we saw right in the beginning was that there isn't a separate me. There is only everything occurring together. You see, the everything or the whole is all there is. And that's always now. It has never left now to move into a tomorrow when it dies or doesn't die. So the whole, if I take a whole forest, certain trees are falling, certain new ones are coming up, the forest stays the same. It's when I focus on one tree and start to say, oh, its bark is darker than the other, oh, its fruit is not, I mean, you know what I mean? Special. Then, <laughs> exactly. Then I've gone into extra focus. And it's this ability to focus that is the suffering of the human mind, but that suffering is only in thinking and illusion. You only suffer in what is not. 
you can't suffer in what is. What you are is not a person. So it was never born. It can never die. Oh, ma. So this, if you, this is that, trippy. I can, so, I, can, I, can, I can talk to you about birth as well. I think that's better. Because okay. if we're going to look at death, we must look at birth. Because they're both two points between which we have this thinking linear happening, right? We've already looked at there's no such thing as time because it's always now. But let's look at birth and see how real that was. Then we'll come to know how real death is because they're both the same thing. They're both mm. just things I think are true and very special, very dramatic, but they're both inexperienced states. I did not experience my birth. Something is born. It's like a plant comes out. It doesn't say, oh, hello, I'm here. I'm green, I'm small, right? A baby is born, but these are words we are using. You have to know that these are words we're using. But it doesn't at that time have the ability of the complexity of human brain to own anything and to remember very much. It's not self-conscious yet. Yeah. So it's just a piece of nature. It cries when it's hungry, it sleeps. It will put anything in its mouth. It doesn't know which is me and which is not me, which is mom and which is aunt, which is the world and which is my family. It hasn't learned all that separation yet. It'll fall off the bed happily and crack its head and die. It's not going to say, oh, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do that. It's very much in the moment. It's not scared of anything. It's not scared of anything, right? Then when it's about two or three years old, it's ready to be brainwashed and opened into a whole world of separation of itself being separate from its own world. Mm. And then it learns, oh, that's my photo. I was such a cute baby. But was there anybody being born? Similarly, a person who's dying is barely conscious enough to say, oh, this is very bad, I'm dying, right? By that time, the brain's already lost most of its ability to create drama. Well, most people who might be their last thought, oh, I don't want to die, and then boom, they're dead. <laughs> yeah, but they're not dead. The thinking, the imagination process stops in nature, but that same imagination is carrying on in billions of other brains simultaneously. Who's to say that one brain was different from this? See, this is a very important point. It's not a linear mathematical point. But everybody is me. So I live forever. There's no difference. There's life. Even on the personal side, all persons are me. And I've actually put this to experience. You know, there's certain times that even I get this human angst of wanting something, you know. Mm. Uh, or my heart was broken or my child's not doing this or my heart didn't do well at the last show or something you know the whole human thing comes in and I feel oh but that artist did really well and we're the same thing right we all know that we all feel a certain peace and a certain joy which we can't explain in measurement terms right right no, what do you mean I like just have... existing there's just existing kind of joy in that yeah and that same joy is there in everything that is being born it's consciousness which is the urge to live, which is very, you might say, joy giving, which is always there. It was never personal. And yet it's existing as so many things, which is why when we meet people and we really slow down, mm. we're all meeting the same one energy that is just simple aliveness. Then we take it up a notch. Let's say three mums are sitting together, one from Africa, one from India, one from Canada. We're all mums. We're all feeling the same hormone of a mother's energy, a love for her child absolutely the same chemical is being released in the brain and the same feelings coming up it's all very technical finally there's nothing personal or emotional about this and nothing special mm. so if you you see when a candle finishes up we just say oh candle finished we don't say it died see that's the difference that's what the human brain does well it brings the drama dead oh, you know? right it did uh it did light uh everything so its energy went somewhere but you could say you could say in physical terms that the energy has been transformed into something else so so yeah, actually, we always explanations for things that are special to us we have we look for no explanation as to why you know the cockroach is so shiny and why he's bronze colored and where did he go i mean we just crush it and throw it off i mean the you know? national geographic people do have <laughs> make shows about it <laughs> i know but I mean, i'm talking to you from my own personal experience yes if you want to freedom the freedom is from yourself and then you're not going to get anything better for yourself so all the agendas have to go and then you find your eternal self you might say i know this sounds dramatic but your eternal self is really a slowing down to very subtle levels where you know that you're never leaving this point 
But that's not Deepa who doesn't leave this point. Deepa's leaving this point all the time when she's like, oh, I need to get there. Oh, this was compared to that. You see, that brain a little bit carries on and there's no problem with it. That's its job. As a human being, you will have some neurosis. You will have hormones and chemicals that will make you dramatic here and there. Yeah. But a few new habits have come in which know that there's not a problem. Mm. Whatever I don't the else has, life is eternal. And it's always one. It actually never moves from here. So it cannot be destroyed. There is no movement. Yet thinking makes us believe as if we move. The movement is only in thought. So would you agree agree with the statement that life cannot be created or destroyed? It just is? Yeah, it just is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. It is. And it gets bigger as you show interest, which is quantum physics. As I look at something it keeps expanding because of my interest in it, not because by itself it has anything. But that would right? imply so my, that you're causing something to happen. No, because my own focus in the thing is not something I can help. So I'm not causing it. Oh, boy. Right? oh wow. <laughs> I see. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The interests and the beliefs are already there. Are already there. That's why. So, so you're think, saying that it, nothing we do is uh, is caused by anything, even by our decision. It's just happening spontaneously of its own. Absolutely. It's just there's no cause and effect. There's no causation because there's only now. I mean, in nature, right? There's this very beautiful Zen line, which is, the bee comes, the flower opens. The flower opens, the bee comes. It's one event. They're not two things. It's one event. It's completely mm. one. It's not two things coming together. That's the way we analyze stuff. We, we bring in time lags and, and things like causation. Yeah, well, um, I think I, I like that perspective, but then um, I think there's two, there's still two purposes of thinking where you're talking about, like, let's say taxes. When, when they decide how, how big how big should the tax rate be and what's that gonna how what's that gonna affect the, the people and you know the tax revenue and all that that seems very linear and it's still in some way is still necessary because it affects um yes if it's necessary then nature will make some people interested in that <laughs> <laughs> right right yes nature will make sure that is happening for the neurosis to play out, which is also part of nature, for the greed to play out, for the fear to play out, for the institutions to play out, to fail, to come up. This is all nature's work. And so this even is, in time, yeah. what is all done by nature, the whole game of confusing you, making you think you need protection, you need cemented homes, you need to farm stuff that nature doesn't provide you naturally. You need to think and you need to use your intellect. You need faster planes and faster trains. And all of that is still sure. nature. And it will bring you to a point of exhaustion. It will bring you to a point of confusion. That where is the happiness I was promised? I got the award. I got the money. I got whatever. And I'm very scared of dying. I mean, that fear will still come. The fear of death. You cannot get away from that. No matter how much technology you have, how much money you have, how many taxes you paid, right? How many you causes you have. Dude, right. right, you're using nature in a, in a very um, interesting way, but I think a lot of people would call that universe because a lot of people wouldn't associate planes and taxes with nature. But I see the way you're using it is like it is is it is the nature of things to to take care of humans. So humans are just gonna do what they're gonna do, and that's and that's yeah. what, how the uh, uh, through time the linear advancement of humans has been. Uh, yes. to build things and to invent things, right? That's what the human fear and neurosis will keep producing, keep going outwards, keep going into time, keep going into space. The curiosity never ends. Uh, and that's fine. That is what happens. That's what the human brain does. And then it also has the beautiful ability that no other life form has to go back to source mm -hmm. and to consciously realize its non-existence, to consciously realize its eternal nature here now which doesn't move with that animals cannot do uh, plants cannot do so human beings can go both ways they can go outwards and cause immense suffering which was, can only put was there a cow that got enlightened by uh, ramana maharshi's cow uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah very sweet i mean such things are so beautiful to read uh, right
There's no explaining why they seem beautiful. And I think that's really what art is, isn't it? That's what philosophy is. That's what people like I are doing. Are, we're breaking down things like measurements, comparisons, going and having setting up conditions to happiness and bringing back simplicity, you know, mm. very, very subtle simplicity, which never leaves you. And in a way, inviting, you know, my, my viewers to a point where fear can be shed and you can know yourself as infinite potential because if, even within the relative world of time and space, you can be anything. You can be anything you're interested in. You know, if you slow down enough, then the heavy conditioning comes off. And there's freedom, there's joy, there's mm. immense joy. And so there's miracles everywhere. There's miracles so if we're everywhere. not burdened by, by the thoughts, uh, I'm not good enough, or I can't do this and can't do that. Yeah. And just go into what, what feels right for you to do and uh, go into that interest and just start doing something that will expand and grow on its own. And you don't need to do much... Um, yeah. uh, you know, uh, deliberation and pondering or what, you just go into action. Isn't that the... Yeah, you go into action. If there's passion there, it will make you go into action. But what I'm suggesting is a bit of a slowing down to examine your assumptions. A lot of times we are running with assumptions which need mm -hmm. examining, you know, and which are not true. Like I'm a separate person. It's right. a very simple assumption on which all our suffering is based. All our comparisons are based on that. But if I look, I, that's not the case. If I hear, that's not the case, right? So just interesting points. I think that's what an artist does. That's an artist's job, to show you something other than what you know. Mm. Uh, you. Uh, I'm interested when you were going through your philosophy uh, stage, was there any philosophy or any philosopher that uh, made you reconcile for the moment when you were reading it, him or her? Nisan Gata, right, was the big one. But uh, I, I would, I, uh, he would be more classified as a mystic, not a philosopher. I'm, I'm answering strictly yes, like. Yeah, philosophy. I don't categorize. Okay. I don't categorize much. Only because for me, when this thing first came to me, it came to me straight out of my own head, mm -hmm. not from uh, a book, not from, uh, you know, a bunch of people or a philosophy or a teacher or nothing, right? So that convinced me that you contain everything already. Then it's just a matter of slowly, it kind of keeps finding you again and again. So which is why I never got into really mainstream structured philosophy ever, even in art. I mean, I don't go into cities and want to visit museums and stuff. I don't do it. I'm not so interested in structured art either. I actually find more beauty just walking on streets, you know, seeing old trees or paint coming off the walls or just how erosion happens on, you know, stones and rocks and, I find all of that a lot more beautiful rather than buildings that house art by big artists. So I'm not fond of structure hmm. or heavy education. I, I think beauty is everywhere. I think art is everywhere. It becomes almost a, a way of living, right? Art is not just what you paint. It's just how you live almost. An artist is artistic in everything, in the way he or she thinks, in the way he or she, the quirky people, right? They're different from uh, structured living. Yeah, they see things differently, and uh, they put things in a in a in a different way. It's a it's a talent. It's a, it's what um, uh, I guess it's what they're here for. Um, yeah. I just wanted to ask um, about the well, since we're talking about goals earlier, isn't uh, yeah. enlightenment the the ultimate goal then in life to get to get free of this uh, cycle of bondage of uh, birth yeah. and rebirth or whatnot to 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 get enlightenment because i think from uh, other works that i know apparently you're helping the world as well by uh, by freeing your yourself from that bondage you're helping others as well yes yes so i think that is the homing device that's already in the brain it's not something that uh, as always it will show up at some point and uh, this is the actual purpose of the complexity of the human brain that it has the ability to cut through all the conditioning and all the limitation that's been there for thousands of years. Because every time I get bonded into something, I'm not just bonding into it now, I'm bonding into its ancient nature. You see, it's the same pain, let's say if it's a mother's pain or a wife's pain or whatever, a lover's pain that every lover's ever had, every mother's ever had. Mm. So it's really uh, not mine, it's an ancient suffering 
and every time you focus on something you're tapping into its ancient nature so yes but at the same time there is also the suffering gets to a point that there is no other way than to look at it differently and the moment you change perspective from being special as a species or as a person the whole structure unravels mm. because in time and space is is built on human beings thinking they're special and they will find something in time what nature has given to them as it is is not enough the miracle of the sun and the stars and how plants grow and how water appears and how animals are is not enough for me it's not enough i need more i need more security i need to be told i'm going to live longer i need separate medicines i need this and that i need technology i need legal systems i'm scared i need to be better than that one this is neurosis and this occurs over time and its solutions also come in time so a sick person will be told if you take this medicine for 10 years you're going to be better in 15 years time or 10 years time so or a he needs a psychologist or something yeah exactly so you're always going into fixing you're always going into time but it doesn't get fixed because then the next thing comes that's the issue with time whatever comes in time becomes addictive and fear doesn't go the only place that things are solved without condition is now now means everything else being as it is all my stories are oh but i needed to get that oh but i i'm waiting to be that i'm waiting to be enlightened so even an enlightenment initially the brain due to its poor habits goes into time for it it thinks it's going to get it in time it thinks it's conditional to its conditionings going off you know the human conditionings that when i'm not this then i'll get enlightened when i'm not that it's yeah. not like that the 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 journey is inwards it's vertical into now into stilling and then automatically the outer things that were of interest they seem to fall away because the interest goes as you're more interested in presence then obviously your interest in going outwards is exhausting i mean things right. that i could do very easily today i find absolutely exhausting so you probably changed a lot from when you were 17 to to now in for, as far yes. as how you look, view the world how you're affected by the world um like do you ever get upset with, with your um uh sons or i don't know do you have a daughter my like and a son i do i absolutely do they are triggers their challenges but i accept that as the the price you pay for ownership that's what happens so if you have if you say it's my kids it's that my word that is going to cause ups and downs so when they are happy i'm going to feel happy when they are low i'm going to feel low but i understand it i don't need to break this down just awareness of it is fine mm. that's the nature that's the nature but of course a lot of things i have dropped the reason i dropped um, working for a you know company or whatever was because i didn't like the competitive environment and the stress that came with proving something to a boss or you know things like that yeah even now, my art it's very non commercial i don't like working with people too much because they get very commercial and competitive and all of that and that makes me uncomfortable so i just leave i just you know just say sorry i can't do this and mm. i'm comfortable doing because um i'm okay with that earlier i wasn't okay with it many many years ago so yes absolutely there are changes that take place even the sort of people i meet when they are talking continuously about you know their problems and their life and this is an issue and you know donald trump or whatever i have no interest absolutely none in politics or fixing the world or why is this and they didn't do that for the virus and they didn't do that for the vaccine or whatever i mean yeah i have no interest I, i i wish them all well i'm not judging because they're only doing what what nature is doing as them and i'm only doing what nature is doing as me so mm. there's no conflict there's no conflict at all so there's no there's no interest so there's no conflict there's no like i wish it was this or that you just uh no, live no. life yeah live life and exactly. uh, in the trust me life brings you what is best aligned for you when you surrender so basically my way of living is the path of surrender it's not a path of analysis okay that's interesting now so how do you then surrender to the moment okay so i i think i should give you more examples which would be more useful rather than okay. talking right so for example when my husband was sick that was surrender that it is what it is and we'll deal with it as it comes it's not a problem so the moment you say something is not a problem you've already surrendered 
because the brain that sees something as a problem immediately goes into solutions. It's only the whole analysis of the world is only there because the world has seen certain problems that it needs solutions for. Right. If you don't see a problem, then you're trusting nature, right? You just put it down on God's feet or whatever so the, they say. So that phrase you said, it is what it is, that to it me is, is surrender. <laughs> surrender, yeah. So right. my, my son is quite sick with, with mono. I mean, he's 17 and you know you get mono at that age and he had high fever for three weeks and i have to say as a mom it was not easy for me to see him this sick he couldn't speak his glands were swollen and he i as a mother you want to be in a position to reassure your child about when they'll get well and you can't do that because they're not yours right so i had to then tell him and he's quite he can slow down quite a bit so i just held his hand and i said look son i don't know when you're going to get better but I do know that I can take you right now to a place where this doesn't feel so bad. If you just slow down with me a little, we can go down to a place where this is not a problem. It's just a vibration. The discomfort or pain in the body is just a vibration. Don't categorize it as pain. Don't call it pain. Don't look for a way out of it. Don't say, when will this go away? Don't resist it. I used to tell that to my kids when they were little, that, oh, a little virus has come with its babies and its families. Let's welcome him. Let him stay. Let him have a party in your body. <laughs> and that just breaks down the resistance, the judgment that we have as human beings. I don't like this. I don't like this. You know, I don't like this virus. When is this going away? When is this changing? When will this go? You're just waiting again. You're in time. Whatever you get in time, you're going to have to pay a price for it. So the only way, the only place of freedom, surrender, joy is right now. Mm. It's right. I think that's what surrender is. But in other things, I think surrender is, for example, my art came to me by itself. It went up into craziness, lots of awards and sales and this and that, and very exciting. And then suddenly it just slowed down. But I didn't do anything for it. I didn't sit around waiting. When is it coming back? What should I do? Should I contact some people? I did a little bit, but I have to say in my life story, whenever I've put effort, nothing happens. Nothing goes my <laughs> well, so way. Hold on, hold on. Some things you have to, even if you like it, you have to put, obviously, people could look at your painting and be like, you're there, there, there's effort in that, you know, creating that painting. I wouldn't call it effort. I'd call it passion. I'd call it madness. I'd call it love. See, when you love somebody, you can't control yourself. Isn't it? Mm. When, you're, when you're madly in love, you can't control there's no, I should do this. That's effort. Effort means I should do this. Effort means I know I'm doing this. But when I paint, there's just passion. I don't know what I'm doing. After I finish, I'm sweating from top to toe. I look at it, right. it's done. But I, but I would some point out that uh, with love, it might be a passionate attachment. So then when you don't have them, you're miserable. Uh, not attachment, because when it's finished, I can't wait to get rid of the painting. I have no attachment to it. I'm just oh, yeah, in love okay, with okay. I'm saying I'm right? saying it's different than some of uh, the Hollywood romance where the guys uh, or the woman is terrified and, and devastated yeah, yeah. that he's gone. This is a bit different, I'm saying. There's oh, yeah, a distinction. Yeah. Relationships are very, very tricky. Yeah, relationships yeah. are very tricky because you've got all the emotions, you've got the hormones, and yes, ownership comes in big time. Relationships, I think, are the hardest, yeah. whether it's with your family or with somebody you in love with it's the hardest yes to break yeah. the attachment but um nature has its ways of, of breaking attachment if <laughs> to, to break well, well, hold on how do you break attachment then with family <laughs> you don't you don't break attachments i think it just happens because you you find that the greatest love that you can give another person is their freedom and freedom from you hmm. to make them independent to gift them the world. That's what I've done with my children. I've gifted them the world. I don't want them to be like me and I don't want to be the center of their world. I'll be on the side supporting. But if I don't hear from them and they're happy, I'm good. Mm -hmm. I'm good. Uh, That's attachment amazing. Never, attachment never feels right. So I've always um, made my children into the highest they can be, you know, with no separation, no limitation, no no, this is better than that, or you should pursue this job or get married by then or have this sort of money, nothing of that sort. So, um, yeah, that, that seems right to me. That's yeah, cool. and yet, That's oh, affection, yeah, yet affection has uh, no boundary. You cannot stop it. You can't stop the affection in the moment from them or from me or from friendships. I mean, I have friends around the world 
uh, everywhere I go, I make friends very easily and we remain in touch. It's effortless. Uh, it needs yeah. no stress, no thing. It just happens. It's like flower comes, bee, you know, flower opens, bee comes. It's the same thing, right? There's no effort. The flower opens exactly when the bee comes. This is nature's work. Mm -hmm. And finally, we, we dedicate or give our personal self to God, to nature, and it runs us. It's just that, do we have that trust? And I've come to that point that, yes, I do. I do. You, you trust good. nature. Everything's going to be all right. Even if, if things huh? on, on appearance sake look bad, like everything yeah. is going to be okay. Or everything is okay. Point. Everything is, is okay. okay. <laughs> the only reason it doesn't look okay is because I'm applying certain templates and conditions to life. And within those, anything can look bad or good. It's a relative world that I get into. And then it gets tricky. But if you slow down, everything already is. And everything already isn't. In the sense that nothing really is, including me. Mm. Right? This voice will go off. The memory will go off in, what, 10, 20, 30 years. I won't remember stuff. I won't remember who I am. That's what we are. I mean, we need to accept this part of us. That anything that depends on memory is transient. It's playing a game in thought. But it's programmed by nature already to fade away. And that's the right. beauty of it, right? Well, the, so there was a... The thing is, in 100 years, we'll probably both be dead. But uh, maybe this will still exist somewhere out there. And, uh, and But nobody will watch because it's such, such a low-resolution low thing. <laughs> <that'll> be... <laughs> but the good thing, there'll be other things that they'll be doing, which will be as fun. I think that's the part. The fun stays the same. The joy stays the same. The aliveness, the joy to live stays the same. Yeah. So there was a line I am back, which I think caught me for months. For months, I kept thinking about that line. And that line he asked was, outside of memory, who are you? And that, to me, yeah. is fascinating because I had already seen that memory is so tricky. It's just made of stuff that is important to me that has been handed down by my conditioning, by my genetics, right? And that's all I remember in my trauma memory, the stuff that's important. And the stuff that's not important doesn't even register, <laughs> but it's disappeared the same way the important stuff has disappeared. Mm. But what is it outside of memory? Because only that is true. Because once memory goes, which it will, as we get older, memory is going to get all dodgy, right? And we think it's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all. It's completely natural. That's the way nature wishes it to be. That's how we get rest. Yeah. Outside and of memory. And you can't answer that question in words. You can't answer it in words. Right. And you even if you, if you are famous, you're not going to be like, people are going to have a different uh, mis, uh, different view of you. They'll be like, uh, see you as historical figure or somebody dead, you know, <laughs> basically. <laughs> you might yeah, leave but, behind movies, you might leave behind writings, or books or whatever, but. Yeah, who is the you? That's nature, right? Nature wishes for things, knowledge to be there. It creates scientists, it creates artists. So what? They belong to nature. They come and go with nature. The knowledge stays. Yeah. Right. The Even knowledge if there's exists. a statue, this is that yeah. guy that lived, you know, from... That's silly. I mean, I find statues and all very silly. As if he, he actually chose to be a warrior or a philosopher. That's how God uh, made him. Some people are programmed certain ways to create certain things. And they do for a certain period of time. Nothing wrong with any of it. Well, if I we think it's talk... beautiful. We, we just honor certain animals and not others and certain people. It's just like yeah, the way it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's why with Maharaj, I mean, I'll read his books, but I'm not into him as such. If I went to Mumbai, I will not go to where he used to be and all of that. And there's no attachment to the person at all or to his face or I don't keep his picture or anything. But it's the knowledge, right? Which was always universal yeah yeah it belongs to everything belongs to everybody everything because there is only the one finally there is just the one mm. and everything that already they don't they're not going to become that five years or ten years they're already that they're already that it's quite mind-blowing the principles you talk about because i could feel myself like almost like uh if i if i could be in that state i'd be blissed out and be like well what i can just lay down uh -huh. and <laughs> do nothing uh, for a while that's um, I, I just wondered, uh, how long does it take you for you to create a picture like that in the behind you? Yeah, a uh, few, uh, few hours, two sittings. Yeah, I think 
one time is just the background, which is 10 minutes, and the next time, two hours maybe. Uh, and if there's a little bit more than maybe another hour. So it doesn't ever take too long because if I'm taking too long with something, then thinking has come in. Mm. So the whole thing about my art is that there's no thinking at all. There's no planning as such. It just goes. I Because I use a knife, I can't even plan on how I'm going to hold the knife that day. It just depends on the energy of the body and the knife and the surroundings. I don't use a brush for this reason because brush goes into condition the ways of holding that you were taught as a child, you know, like a pencil or a pen. How, how do you use a knife to paint? I had never heard that before. Uh, palette knife like this. Oh. Okay. And this is not the way I use my hands. So it's, it's organic. It does its own thing. The amount of pressure I put, the amount of paint I pick, I can't control it. My mind cannot control it. So many of my own paintings, I want to do another one like them. And I always have a big laugh because I have no idea how it started and how it came to mm. be like this. Right. So right. this is the beauty of, uh, of uh, passion and art that you can't replicate it because it's not being registered in active memory. Right. Cool. You know? um, wow. We, we talked a lot about, about a lot of things. Is there anything uh, mm -hmm. you think uh, we left out? I don't know. I don't think so. I think we're good. <laughs> okay. Um, well, Deepa, uh, it was great to have you on the podcast. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Matt. It was lovely to be with you. And thank you, everybody, for listening or watching the podcast.